Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole wide world to Big Time Burleson, Texas, y'all? This is the Open Door Experience. Boom! <laughs> Outstanding. Guys, I want to welcome you to a midweek service, and I'm actually going to be talking to you. I'm actually going to be preaching part three of my Redeeming Your Timeline sermon series, and going to be delivering that, and uh, super excited about getting into the stuff that we're going to get off into. Because look, I have props. I'm a lot like Gallagher. Anybody know Gallagher? I love props. It's like <laughs> anybody that's, you know, below the age of 40 doesn't have a clue who Gallagher, the genius, was. Anyway, I do. I've got, I have up here on top of this really cool podium. I've got this podium, and I have, I have seven blocks. Everybody go, ooh. And I'm going to illustrate one. Two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh. Yeah, you knew seven was coming, right? That's good. Yeah, that's good. Very impressive. Actually, we were talking today with the production team, and it's like, man, they hate, they hate for me to put the seven chairs up here because it, it's just tough on cameras, and I'm a fat guy, and I got to get up, sit down, I got to get up, and sit down. And Actually, for everybody who's listening on the radio, that's not true. I'm six foot seven, and I'm chiseled, and... Blonde-headed and blue-eyed. Do you know that Josh Tolley was here over the weekend? He said, dude, somebody told me that you were six foot seven and chiseled and blonde-haired and blue-eyed. He goes, I thought, what the heck? I said, yeah, I lie on the radio, and I tell people that all the time. But with that said, I have seven blocks here in front of you because I'm talking about redeeming your timeline. And I want to I want to just say a great big thank you to everybody who has been getting the book. Um, it's still number one in, on Amazon in a whole bunch of categories. And nobody will ever be able to take that away from me. And I'm, I am so grateful. You know, number one bestseller, Troy Brewer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Barely graduated high school. Barely. Had to cheat to graduate, actually. The Lord has redeemed all that. And that's funny to me. Well, friends... Whenever we first started this whole thing on redeeming your timeline, I, it all goes back to a couple of basic premises. The entire book has five premises in it, and a premise is a line of logic that brings you to a conclusion. And we need to be careful of the premises that we believe, and we also need to own the responsibility of the conclusions we come to in every single part of our life. You know, you marry some knucklehead, if you're not... If you're not careful or you go through a couple of marriages like most of us do, you might be somebody who says, okay, my premises are I'm not good in relationships or I have not had good relationships, so my conclusion is I can't have healthy relationships. Okay, that's the devil and it's a liar. It's a lie. And so we have to own the responsibility of the premises and the conclusions we come to through the line of logic that we face every single decision-making paradigm we have. So, I mean, you can look at everything through a lens that is not redeemed, and your eye will be evil, or your lens will be evil. And Jesus said, if your eye is evil, then your whole body is evil. So the lens of how you view things is so important. It's so important. You know, the Bible says that he will guide you with his eye. There's a whole bunch of different explanations and a whole bunch of different layers of revelation as to what that actually means. But one of them is, you know, if, if you're so close to Jesus and if you're like King David and you have set the Lord continually before you and you're in his face and you're looking at him and he begins to look this way, what happens? You, you go like, okay. And you know how that works in your life? He will begin to highlight certain things. The Spirit of the Lord will begin to highlight certain things for you to pay attention to. Do you recognize that? Okay, that's part of the way of him leading you with his eye. But that doesn't happen unless you know him face to face. And that's a whole different layer of relationship. To behold the face of God is a really, really, really big deal. A really big deal. Now, to, hold, to, to behold the face of God means to be in perfect relationship with him. Now, if you get into the face of God, the Bible says that he calls you and he calls Israel and he calls Jerusalem, he calls us the apple of his eye. 
And one of the revelations of understanding of the apple of his eye is this. You're so close to him, you can see your reflection in his eye. That's the apple of his eye. That reflection of you in his pupil. Like, whoa. Okay, in other words, you're seeing you through his lens. Right on. And that's a whole different mamba jamba. Can you guys tell I'm about to get it on? I'm about to preach up in here. Can you feel it? Me too. Because I, I just felt my baby leap whenever I just said that. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Do you know that language? <laughs> Thank you, my sister. <laughs> Bringing it. So I just felt that the Lord's like, yeah, it was just like Rochelle. Preach that. Preach that. Just felt it. Well, so... In our relationship with the Lord, what happens is we learn how to have a redemptive view of things. We begin to have a redeemed world view, that our entire view of the world. And guys, you need to own the responsibility of your world view. And if you don't know what a world view is, you need to look it up on Google. You look everything else up. You look up pizza joints on Google. Look up world view and find out what a Christian world view is as opposed to a humanist world view. Right? And you have to own the responsibility because what happens is in, within a, a humanist worldview, there are certain premises that lead you to certain conclusions. In a Christian worldview, there are certain premises that lead you to certain conclusions. And you have to own the responsibility of saying, I know this to be truth. And I'm hanging on to this. I'm not going to let it go. And I know this to be truth. And I'm going to hang on to that. And I'm not going to let it go. Until ultimately, I'm always concluding this. And it has to be a godly conclusion. You know, one of the things, no matter what atrocities that I see throughout the world, I refuse to let go of the premise that God is good. I'm not, I'm not going to let it go. And you're not going to shake, you're not going to shake that from me. If I can look into the eyes of thousands of boys and girls who have been molested and thousands of boys and girls who have been literal slaves, if I can look into the eyes of thousands of people who have been displaced and their crime was that they were poor, and see the tragedy of humanity and the horror of humanity upon other human beings and still look you in the eye and say, God is good. You ain't going to shake that from me. And I, it's, it's one of the things that me and Leanna talk about all the time. and say, okay, well, no matter what, no matter how we go through this, let's determine right now that God is good. And we all say, God is good. Like, yes, ma'am, God is good. So we're owning the premises no matter what, what the facts are. Because the facts change. From moment to moment to moment to moment to moment, the facts change. The facts are not everlasting truth. They're not forever truth. The fact of the matter is, you might not even feel like you're saved. Well, that ain't true. It's a fact. But it's a fact I feel like it. So you have a worldview that says everything revolves around your feelings. Because you have swallowed the lie of a premise that didn't come from God. See, Jesus said in the last days, we would have to guard our hearts so that we would not be deceived. Oh my goodness, he knew what he was talking about, didn't he? He sure did. And the Lord knew exactly what he was talking about. Well, when it comes to time, I, I've been searching God out for years and years concerning time because, I mean, we might as well get good at it because we're all in it. It's kind of like Josh Holly got up here and talked about the importance of us having finances. I've spent the whole week with him and it's, it's been a good week. And, and, uh, you know, and just going over, what is my view of finances and what are my strategies? What strategies do I have? Or am I just saying I'm just believing God? Okay, it's good to believe God when you don't have a strategy. It's better to partner with God in a strategy. Believing God when you don't have a strategy is a wilderness experience. Partnering with God in a strategy is a promised land experience. In the wilderness, nobody had a plan. Nobody had a strategy. All they had was, oh, i got to stick with God. That's it. And that's the lesson of the wilderness that all of us have to learn is this. No matter what, do not bail. That's the lesson of the wilderness. He's going to be a cloud by day. He's going to be a fire by night. And don't get out from under the cloud because you die. Don't get away from the fire by night because you die. Don't get out of eyesight of the Lord because if you get snake bit, you'll die. Don't get away from the camp because you'll starve to death. So just learn the lesson. Don't have a plan. Don't have a strategy. Believe that God is the answer and stick with him. Okay, that's only supposed to be a 40-day journey. And sometimes that turns into a 40-year journey. 
And we have to keep going around the mountain and keep going around the mountain and keep going around the mountain and keep going around the mountain because we don't learn the lesson of the wilderness, which is this. Do not bail from the presence of God no matter what. But then the day comes, come to that river. And you stand there at that river and he says, we're going to cross over now. And you cross over and this is one of the greatest and most dramatic verses in the Bible to me is when they came to the River Jordan. After 40 years of being miraculously fed, the Bible says, and the manna ceased. That the way it had always been was no longer ever again. And there was a new program. You better get with a new program. Do you know that we're in that time right now? Do you know that we're in such a huge time of transition worldwide right now that what used to work is, is not going to work anymore? That you're going to have to be willing to change your wineskin? And if you fight for the way things used to be, you're going to fight for what no longer matters. And you won't be in the right fight. And I tell you this, my friends. There is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is coming for those who are willing to change their wineskins. There is a move of God that is going to take place that is so good and so big and it's so real. Prophets have been prophesying the billion soul harvest and people laugh and laugh and laugh. I laugh, but now I'm not laughing at it. I'm laughing at those jokers who don't believe that God Almighty is able because he is able. And there is such a wine that's about to be poured out. He's not willing to waste it on a wineskin that's not new. A new wine is coming. Tell the person next to you, tell them, say, a new wine is coming. Well, everybody's got to deal with time, and everybody's got to deal with finances, and everybody's got to deal with relationships. And if you're going to have any kind of mastery in your life, and if you're ever going to get in a place where your battle is no longer survival, you're going to have to get into a place of mastery of those things. And time is indeed one of those things that we think that we have so much time because when we're young, we think that 70 years old is old, old, old. Until you get near 70 and you're like, that really ain't that old. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, you know I, was, I, was, I was on the Jim Baker show this week and I was talking to Jim Baker. That, that brother's 83 years old. And I was like, sir, are you really 83 years old? He said, yes, sir, I sure am. And then he said, and I'm just getting started. <laughs> and I was like, dang. Like, okay, 83 is not the ancient of days. It's not. And I remember when it was. And it's amazing how once you get over 50, how 50 is a young man. <laughs> the point of that is time is relative. Because <laughs> there are a lot of people that are old and ragged out when they're 22. And time is extremely relative. And, and, and physics has proven that time is relative. It's proven it. It's, time is relative to space. It's relative to velocity. It's, it's relative to gravity. Time literally changes depending on if you're coming or if you're going. Now there's a, there's a version of that in the Word of God that that tells us that a lot of scriptures say, and when the time has passed, and then other scriptures say, and when the time had come. Okay, all those scriptures that say, when the time had passed, whatever happens after that is always bad, because we're talking about unredeemed time. But whenever it says, and when the fullness of time had come, now we're talking about redeemed time, because I'm telling you, one of the things that time is relative to is redemption. Time changes at the presence of Jesus. Because time is relative to Jesus Christ. Time has to act the way Jesus wants it to. See, okay, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second and you cannot change it. But the speed of light goes by different rules when it comes into certain gravitational fields. Or the speed of light goes by different rules depending upon if, 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 if okay, so Einstein had this this crazy thing that happened to him. He was in Bern, Switzerland, and there's this big old ancient medieval clock, and it's got these bears and cool stuff, and it comes out. And one day, he was on a streetcar, and he was headed the opposite direction, and he heard it go off, and he turned around, and something 
clicked in his mind that changed everything. And it's where we get the theory of relativity. Now you're like, okay, will you quit talking about that and talk about Jesus? I am talking about Jesus. You just don't know it yet. I'm about to get to that. Okay? So, so what happened was he, he was like, okay, wait. I, and he came up with this theory of relativity. And then he later came up with the theory of special relativity, and that's, which was kind of the upgrade from that. Now, what, how that works is this. Okay, dude, if I'm on a train, and if I'm at the back of the train, and if I'm shining a light forward, what's real is um, to the guy that is to, uh, what's real is to the guy that's on the train shining the light, light is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Are you guys tracking with me on that? So let's just say this is the train, this is the engine, and this is the caboose. Are y'all with me? It's like, choo-choo, all right? Okay, so let's say I'm right here, and I'm like, dude, to do, I'm in this car right here. I am shining a light this way. Okay, if, you, if I was to take a, a speed checker and go, how, how fast is my light going? It's going 186,000 miles per second because that's the only speed that light can travel. But here's the deal pickle. What if I'm on the outside of the train, looking at the train, and the train is going 70 miles an hour that way, and I took a speed check of the light? It's 186,070 miles an hour. So it means it's relative to the observer. All right, do I need to explain that again? Because I want you to get that. The, the speed of light is different to the guy that is on the train than it is to the observer that is off the train because the train is moving. So if it's moving at 70 miles an hour, that means the speed of light is 70 miles an hour faster to this person than it is to this person. So time is relative to the what? To the observer. Okay, now let's go back talking about the lens that you and I look through. Because now I'm talking about, now I'm talking about if your eye is evil, then everything is evil, including your time. Now, I'm going to tell you some crazy things, and I want to tell you one of the crazy things that I want to tell you is that this timeline, this actually represents a timeline that begins right here at the beginning of human history. And let me tell you where the beginning of human history begins. It does not begin at the birth of Adam. It does not begin at the creation of the world. It begins at the fall of Adam. God Almighty told Adam, in the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of sin and death, you shall surely die. Okay, this is 1,000 years, and he died on the 930th year after he sinned. A day is to the Lord is 1,000 years. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years in a biblical human history timeline. Now, what that means is from the fall of Adam to Abraham from here to here is 2,000 years. From Abraham to King Jesus is 2,000 years. From Jesus to right now is 2,000 years. Where does that mean we're at? We're at the return of King Jesus in the millennial reign, the 1,000-year millennial reign. We're right at the seventh day. That's where we are in the timeline. We are literally right here. We're, we're, we're right here. Jesus is coming back soon, y'all. He is. And it's not some hokey pie in the sky, weirdo thing. Dude, Jesus is coming back. Sure shooting. He really is. Now, I had an encounter with the Lord. And I want to tell you about this weirdo encounter I had with the Lord. Now, I, I didn't share this for a long time because it was so far out there for me. And I was not surrounded by the people I'm surrounded by now. And maybe you've been in that place where you've had next level encounters with the Lord and you couldn't share it with anybody because they already thought you were crazy. Okay. Well, you're safe now because you are surrounded by next level crazy folk right now. You are. And I thank God for that. I say, welcome. Welcome to the deep end. <laughs> I'll tell you, you think you're crazy until uh, Jamie Galloway comes and spends a week with you. Bro, an angel came in my room last night. Did he show up in yours too? I'm like, no. Dude, let him in, man. Let him in. Sometimes he starts knocking. I go, dude, I, I heard a knock last night. Dude, you should have let him in. <laughs> Anybody in here ever hear knocks? Am I the only person? Okay, all right, thank you. I just, yeah, I'm just saying. I hear this all the time. 
I'm telling you, I hear it all the time. And I'm like, well, if you're of the Lord, come on in. If you ain't, stay out in Jesus' name. I'm not real sure how to answer that knock yet. Oh, I got all kinds of next level weirdo stuff that's just fun stuff between me and God. And I want to tell you, man, you just need to have some stuff that's between you and the Lord that everybody else think is stupid, but you just think is crazy. I got stuff like that between me and Leanna. She, there are things that me and I say to each other that would sound so stupid if I said it to anybody else. But it's, it's a joke. You know, I, like, okay, one of the things that's between me and Leanna is, I don't know if you've ever seen this thing. Have you ever seen that crazy video? I think it was on The Voice where there was this chick from uh, uh, New Orleans, and she had this horrible song. You, you know, aren't those fun to watch when it's like when they're really bad? And she likes gets up and the music starts boom, boom, boom. She's like, you know where I'd be? I'll tell you where I'd be. I'd be in my studio. Stu, stu, studio. Up, up in my studio. Stu, stu, studio. And they're like, nah, like the gong show. Get out, right? So I'm in the studio every single day, all day long. And so me and Leanna have this weirdo thing between us. I was like, well, you know where I'll be. And she starts going, studio, studio, stu, stu. And she looks stupid to anybody else. I think it's awesome. Because it's just funny. Okay, well, when you're in relationship with people, when you, have something, when you have certain experiences with people, there are things between you that don't make sense to anybody else. So you're ready for this? It ain't for anybody else. And there's stuff between you and the Lord, man, that you've been walking in where God does this sometimes. They're like, uh, they're like nobody would approve of that if I tell them. Well, then don't tell anybody. Or tell everybody and make them all go away. Get all weird on them. They'll run off. But they'll end up calling you when they get cancer. All hell breaking loose. Oh, they're looking for that crazy person. Now, here's that. Which, like, that's crazy. That's really not crazy. It's a knock. It's really not that extreme. But what if it's God? It is God. He says to the church of the Laodiceans, Behold, I stand at the door and I lock. And if any man will hear my voice. To me, when I hear that, I think it's God saying, I'm talking to you, boy. That's right. Let me in. Like, come on in. You're so welcome. Come on in, baby, take a load off. Come on in. I don't know why I'm thinking that stupid song. I hadn't heard that song in 30 years. Oak Ridge Boys. Like 1982, I think. <laughs> baby, take a load off. <laughs> y'all know, y'all remember the song now. You're like, yeah, that was ridiculous. I'm sorry. I apologize. What was I saying before I was so rudely interrupted by the voices in my head? Yeah, before that. Yeah. Yeah, this is next level teaching, isn't it? I'm a little bit tired. This is a timeline. I remember that part. So we were talking about the fall of Adam. It doesn't begin at the birth of Adam. I don't know how long Adam lived before, before he sinned. I don't know if it was a moment. I don't know if it's a billion years. Now, I'm not saying it might be a billion years because... Because I have to have a very old earth history because I don't have to have an old earth history. Even though scientists will tell you today that the earth is very old, and I would like to address that. Is it okay with you if I take on that tough question and just kind of give you my spin on how that works? Let me, so it begins here. It goes to Abraham. From Abraham, by the way, this is King David. King David is exactly 1,000 years before King Jesus to the day. As a matter of fact, whenever, whenever Jesus, I'm sorry, whenever King David came into Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant is 1,000 years to the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem when they screamed, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. <laughs> Palm Sunday. That's exactly 1,000 years to the day, okay? And so we're like, okay, so you got to learn what's the kind of stuff that goes on in, on this day. This is also seven days, right? What's kind of, what happens in this day? What happens in this day? What happens in this day, and we know that there was 400 years of silence before King Jesus was born, right? So we only know really what happens in the first half of this and then the part where Jesus shows up. Okay, well, what happened here in the early church? What happened in the medieval church? What's happening right now? This is a timeline. This is, and, and guys, you, since you're in the timeline, you might as well learn it. I mean, if you're going to drive a truck, you might as well learn all the bells and whistles that's in it. 
I bought my dad last year, um, about a year before he died, I bought him a brand spanking new Dodge Caravan because he was a Dodge Caravan guy. He, I don't know why he had to have a caravan. I don't know why, but he's, he, he hated change. Okay? I did not get the brave part of me from him. Ah, oh, boy, I've been driving a Dodge Caravan. Ha, ha. Hey, I'll just drive a Dodge. Well, I surprised him, and I actually bought him. I told him I was broke down. And I said, Daddy, I'm broke down, and I need your help. Where you at? Oh, my God, where you at? What? Ah, yatahe, yatahe, Mahani. He talked like a Comanche Indian. He didn't even know Comanche. <laughs> He'd seen a few John Wayne movies and thought he could speak Comanche Indian. I'm not making that up. He's a very eccentric dude, man. Very eccentric. Ah, oh, yatahe, Mahani. Ha, ha. Okay, I'll be there. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry about nothing. I'll be there. Where you at? I'm in such and such car lot. And he came over and said, where's your car? And I'm like, Dad, let me have your keys. And said, what? And I said, I just sold your car. What? Yeah, and I traded it in on that car right there. And it was a glorious, wonderful day. Well, about a month and a half, and it was brand spanking new. Brand new. It was cool. It was a good day. Always, always, I had a dream. I'd always be able to do that for him someday, and I did it. Hallelujah. Guys, you need to have those kinds of goals within your life. I'm telling you, you do. You need to have that. So anyway, about a month and a half or two months later on, uh, he came out to the ranch, drove it out there. He had his stupid little dog named Doc Holliday, which I can't stand that dog. <laughs> little weenie dog. Like, who? <laughs> Doc Holliday. He thought he was so brave and so tough. Like, that's the most pathetic excuse of a dog I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, Doc Holliday. He, he's good against them prowlers, boy, I tell you. He, he'll bark at them prowlers. Like, what prowlers are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, that's my dad. So he comes over, and I get in the car, and I say, so, Dad, how are you liking this car? Oh, son, it's not, I can't. I, I mean, he hadn't had a car that had air conditioning in it. Uh, you know, all the windows work. Ha. <laughs> Real AC, I tell you that. I'm like, well, hey, what do you think about this adaptive cruise control? What? Yeah, adaptive cruise control. Cruise control? I said, yeah, cruise control. And this is adaptive, meaning it will slow down if there's a car in front of you that's doing 45. If you got it set on 75, oh, I never drive 75. And he wouldn't. If he ever drove over 35 miles an hour a day in his life, it was because he was drinking and driving before he was saved. Because he was horrified of everything. And so, yeah, that's my dad. I know that sounds crazy. Can you imagine how I drove him crazy as a young man? Like, what's wrong with my kid? Because <laughs> I'm like, woo! So, so anyway, he said, what? I said, I said, yeah, dad, look, okay, I'm going to show you how to work this. We're going to get out on the highway. I'm going to show you how cruise control. He goes, no, 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 no. Don't want any of that. I, I said, why? I said, dad, you got all these bells and whistles you don't know nothing about. No, no, no. Why don't you want... Why don't you want to use cruise control? Why would you not want that? Because, son, some dang communist, a Chinaman, might take it over and drive me off a cliff somewhere. <laughs> so he told me. I'm like, it's not autopilot. <laughs> and there ain't no Chinaman going to take over your vehicle and drive it off of a cliff. Well, just exactly like that. As ludicrous and as silly as that sounds, when it comes to time, we got all these bells and whistles that you and I can actually operate with God in, in our timeline where we're scared to touch anything because we're not smart enough or whatever. I want to tell you that God Almighty does not control time. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you that time does not control God Almighty. God Almighty absolutely controls time. And if you partner with him, I'm telling you right now, you can begin to have mastery in your timelines. I want to give you some examples of how God can deal with time. Okay, first of all, he can order time. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. If God is not a God of disorder, and if your timeline has always been chaotic, and if you've always been out of sync, that curse can be redeemed. Because the definition of a curse is that you're out of sync. You know what Jesus said at the end of this fourth day? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you missed your day of visitation. You're out of sync. And now a curse is going to be upon you. Do you know what the curse is in Deuteronomy chapter 28? If you will not obey the voice of the Lord, if you will not partner with God, the Bible says that in the evening you will say, I wish it was morning. In the morning you will say, I wish it was evening. And you will be out of sync. Well, God is a God of order. And he can literally set up an order to where you love the time of your life right now. 
Listen, my 20s were way better than my teens. My 30s were way better than my 20s. My 40s were way better than my, than my 30s, yeah. And my 50s are way better than my 40s were. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. Now, do I have aches and pains? Well, yeah, I do. And, you know, do I have challenges? Yeah, I do. But, dude, I'm stupid blessed. And I'm in the right season. And here's the deal. I'm not trying to act like I'm 25. And I'm not out losing my mind, cheating on my wife. And I'm not freaking out. And I'm not, you know, dude, I'm a grandpa. And I, want, I love being a grandpa. And I love I loved being a pastor. I'm in sync with the right timing so I can be blessed. Okay, here's another, here's another scripture. Did you know he can stop time? In Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged itself on its enemies. Do you know that God could give you more time? He can literally go, okay, I'm gonna stop the timing of this thing for a while. The end was supposed to come today, but I'm just looking at you, dude, you need a lot more time. Yes, you have the right in relationship with King Jesus to ask him for more time if you need it. I, have you ever considered that? Okay, here's another one. He can accelerate time. Amos chapter 9, 13 says, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Come on. He can change time. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back 10 steps and it's gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. He can change space and distance because it's in continuum with time. He can do all these things. That's Acts chapter 8. I could go through. I have a ton of scriptures in here. But I want to just tell you this. While you and I are subject to time, the spirit of the living God that is within us is not subject to time. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you something crazy. I'm telling you that God, this is you. This is the day that you were born. Uh, this is the day you got married. I'm going to say this is where you're at because I'm nice. This is the day right here at the end of this day where you take your last breath of Texas air and your first breath of heaven's air. That's what that is. Some of you are older than you think you are. And some of you are going to live a lot longer than you think you will. And you're younger than you think you are. You need to get in sync with your timing. Teach me, O oh Lord, to number my days that I might apply my heart in, unto wisdom. There's a wisdom in knowing where you're at in your timeline. God won't tell me that. Ask him. Can I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something crazy and you guys can you guys can believe me or you can call me a liar, but Leanna's family has this weird deal where God tells the men in her family the day that they're going to die. I'm going to go back um, a couple of generations ago and tell you this, that she had a grandfather and her grandfather um, went to a, he, he belonged to the Baptist church in uh, Kansas, in um, El Dorado, Kansas. And he's up there in El Dorado, Kansas. And there he is. And he goes to the Baptist church there. And he tells them this. He says, you know what? God Almighty told me to take everything I have out of the bank and to build you guys a new sanctuary. And he told me that after I, after I drive the last board into this place, the first, the very first service you're going to have is going to be my funeral. And they're like, okay. And so this old man goes to work. Takes him about a year and a half because he's working by himself. And he builds a new sanctuary. And he gets done, and he looks at the whole thing, and he said, okay. Goes home, calls his son, tells him he loves him, puts on the suit he wants to be buried in, gets in bed, and dies. Wow. Daryl Knight, are you in here? That's Daryl Knight's grandfather. Daryl and I and my, and my wife are brother and sister. Pastor Daryl, our missions pastor. He said, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Leanna's family's weird. <laughs> Don't y'all know it was a good day for him when I hooked up with his sister? <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you another story. Leanna's dad, Ray Knight, the guy who made me start the Open Door Food Bank. Ray and I had this, uh, I had a very special relationship with Ray. Ray and I were very good friends. He had so many troubled sons, and I was one of them. He had, he was a foster dad 
And he had five biological children, and Leanna is one of them. And they also raised over 300 foster children throughout their lifetime. Leanna grew up in a madhouse of foster children. And I remember the very first time that I ever went over to Leanna's house and saw the madness that was her house. I couldn't believe it. And they were the most loving, giving, extraordinary people you can possibly imagine. Leanna grew up like that. That's why, she, that's, that's why she's the way she is. That was her house. Those were her biological parents. And she grew up with lots of other little girls sleeping in her bed. And that's how Leanna grew up. So he, he would spot troubled, troubled kids, and he would spot troubled boys, and he took in a lot of troubled kids and raised them. He took one look at me and went, that's my boy. And he loved me. I mean, he really did love me. And I had a very, very unique and very special relationship with Ray. I, he really was a daddy to me, and uh, he really did love me, and he was a cool dude. Ray called me up one day and said, Troy, I want you to come over. I said, okay. He said, well, I done went and heard the Lord. I went, you did? What did he say, Ray? Yeah, he told me I got this year and I got next year and I'm going to make it to Christmas, but I ain't going to see New Year's, so I need to get to work. I'm like, okay, weirdo. So what do you want to do? I want to do this and this and this and this and this. And it was food bank stuff. It was family stuff. And he told me that. And dude, he's picture of health, perfect health. Well, that year, he got through the whole year, and he's completely healthy. About halfway through the next year, he got sick, and he got bad. And the whole family was like, he's going to die any, any moment. And I'd call him, and I'd say, he'd ring, ring, ring. He'd say, hello? And I'd say, are you dead yet? I done told you, boy. I'm going to make it to Christmas, but I ain't going to see New Year's. I was like, all right, just checking on you, just seeing if that word was real, man. Hang on there. It's going to be a cool Christmas. I say, okay. I call him a few days later. You dead yet, Ray? No. I done told you, boy. I won't make it to Christmas, but I ain't going to see New Year's. That year, which was you know, I'm old and I don't remember how long ago it was, but I'm going to say it was around 10 years ago. Maybe it wasn't that long ago, but maybe it was. I don't know. But it was the Christmas that we had the big snow. Do you remember we had the huge snow in North Texas? Does anybody remember how long ago that was? See, y'all don't know either. See, that's when you know you're old. Like 2009 or something like that, you think? Yeah. So do you, do you remember when it was, Pastor Gloria? Yeah, okay. So I, that Christmas, guys, we, it was the most magical Christmas ever because Ray was near death. And all of the kids, Leanna's Christmas time is absolutely incredible. It's, it's, it's incredible because all the kids and all the foster kids get together. And it's like a circus. I mean, it's just crazy. You have no idea who's going to show up, Right. And that day, it was snowing outside. We had an awesome Christmas. And the entire family just crammed into Ray's bedroom. And Mindy Knight was laying up in the bed with him. My daughters were laying up in the bed with him. I was sitting on the edge of the bed. Everybody was standing around the room. And we were all talking to him. And he was sitting up in bed, happy as a lark. And he told me a couple of things that day. I said, I told him, I said, Ray, I said, uh, has God been talking to you? And he said, yeah. He said, I saw the Spirit of the Lord come through that part of the wall the other day. And he came right out like this. And he goes, I don't know if he's an angel. I don't know what he was, but he came out and he said, almost there, Ray. And he went right back into that wall. So I said, well, you know what, man? You, you're liable to make it to New Year's. And he goes, what did I tell you, boy? <laughs> and I said, Ray, I'm just, hey, man, listen, maybe we can just ask God for more time. Maybe we, let's ask God for more time, and I want you to live for a long, long, long time. I done told you. I'm going to make it to Christmas, but I ain't going to make it to New Year's. Well, it was snowing, and I had to drive all the way back to Joshua from North Azel, and I was like, well, look, we got to go, and the sun went down, like, we got to go. And I gave him a big hug, and I told Ray Knight, 
I said, Ray, you made it to Christmas, man. You did it. He said, I told you I'd make it to Christmas. I said, I think it's the best Christmas I've ever had in my life. He said, it's the best Christmas I've ever had in my whole life. We got home, and when we got home, they called us, and Ray was gone. And he made it to Christmas and didn't make it to New Year's. Exact, I mean, God told him a year and a half before he died, he told him his timeline. There's actually, and you're like, well, that's just too scary for me. Not if the Lord tells you he'll meet you in that place. Not at all. Not if God tells you, hey, man, I'm going to meet you there. Do you know that God told Brother Peter at the end of the book of John, I've seen how your death glorifies me. I've seen it. And he said, and this he said concerning how his death would glorify the Lord. He told, I mean, he's walking with Peter going, dude, I've seen your last day and it's rock star. I've already been there. I've, see, you're, you're right here. See, I'm not subject to time. I just went to the back of your train and checked out that. Oh, I'm, I'm with you right now in that moment. If you can get this, there's no reason for you to be fearful of anything in your future because you can ask the presence of the Lord to be here. Do you know how come, do you know, and by the way, if, if this is where you're at now, and if you have the God-given ability to invite Jesus into your now, let me tell you, past, present, and future is all the same to him. If you have the ability to invite Jesus into your now, you can also invite him into your future. You can. The reason why I'm so bold when I get up on stage is because my prayer, every time I know I'm going to preach anywhere at any time, is, Lord, meet me on that stage. And I know, I know when I get up on the stage, Jesus is going to be here. Amen. And so I'm not scared of any group of people. I'm not scared of anything. No matter how many cameras they put on me, as long as I know that the Lord is with me, I'm not afraid. And I prayed. And even though I was a week out, I asked the Lord to be there. And I know he was there before I got there. And when I got there, boom, he was there. Because I asked him there. Now, here's the other thing. If you can invite him into your future, I know this is crazy. This is you. Why can't you invite him into your past, into some unredeemed place where the flow of time is taking everything away from you as opposed to the kingdom is coming? So what does that look like? Like, wait a minute, I can't, it's stupid for me to ask God to, you know what? I, I prayed a stupid prayer today that I bet that God answered. My good friend Mason told me that he had a friend of his who killed himself. Mason runs our, our ministry here, and he actually had a funeral to go to today. And he told me about it. And he said, Troy, I'm so heartbroken over it. And he has a mutual friend who is really heartbroken over it, really. And I prayed with him. I said, man, I want to pray with you about that. He said, okay. I prayed with him. And while I prayed with him, I said, Father, God, you're not subject to time, and I want to speak into this situation. And I pray, God, at the last few seconds of his life that he would come to know you and that you would be with him in the worst moment of his life. Like, he couldn't do that. He did it with Samson. Sorry to mess with your theology. What I'm saying is this, and Samson's in the Hall of Fame of Faith, and he offed himself. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody do that. I wouldn't take a chance if I was you. But I'm telling you this, that God is not subject to time or space or matter, and he's so powerful that he can literally enter into the worst unbelievable, tragic situation that's already passed and change that from something that's not redeemed into something that is redeemed. Maybe you're, I don't know, you know I, I've, I've had friends that I, I've known that have died in terrible situations throughout the world. And I go, when did that happen? And they go, well, it happened four days ago. Oh, no. Oh, no. And you just go into that, oh, no, that can't be true. I'm like, that ain't true. I don't believe that that person is dead. I don't believe that. And then when it hits you that, that it is true, you go, okay, here's the deal. Father, be in that car the last few minutes of their life and make the last few minutes of their life the best few minutes of their life and be greater than that horrible tragedy that was about to befall them. Father, I pray, God, in the mighty name of King Jesus, that your presence would be manifest in that situation, even though it's time passed. Like, well, that's just crazy. Not if you look at time like a train. And if Jesus owns the train and he can enter into any car he wants to enter into. Oh, I know it's crazy. But I'm just telling you this. We everybody, we've got all these, we got all this stuff that we can cooperate with God on. And we're like, no, nope, I don't want to mess with that. I'm just too scared. I ain't scared. I ain't scared. 
I'm going to end with this verse because it's time for me to end. And I'm going to read to you Psalms 139. I encourage you guys to read that in the King James, and the New King James, and the NIV, in every different way that you can, because you got to get what it's saying. Bust out a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and look up every single word of Psalms 139, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read to you from the Passion Translation, and this is how the Passion Translation puts it. Let me put on some glasses. You perceive every, mo- every movement of my heart and soul, And you understand my every thought before it even enters into my mind. That means this. You know my relationship with you, past, present, and future. You know how I'm going to respond before I respond. You're already there. Then it says, you are intimately aware of me, Lord. You know me like nobody else knows me. Then it says, you read my heart like it's an open book. You know what you can do with an open book? You can flip to any page you want to. You read my heart like it's an open book and you know all the words that I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. And now get this, because this is about redeeming your timeline. You've gone into my future to prepare the way and in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. That is the word of God. That God, oh man, that listen, you can have such a relationship with God in the now that you're also having a relationship with him in the future and in the past. If you have something in your past that has been cursing you your whole entire life, the answer for you is the manifest presence of Jesus in that thing. Redemption is the answer because redemption changes everything. If you have some fear of your future, way off in the future, if you have that, The answer for you is the manifest presence of Jesus. And you need not be afraid of that. Have courage, have courage, have courage. For I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, says the Lord. Friends, we're barely getting off into this. And I've rambled a lot tonight about a lot of silly things. But you need to know this. Your timeline is precious to God. He loves your timeline. He loves when you were a little boy or you were a little girl. He... (laughs) He loves when you were growing up. He loves that part of you that was wild and adventurous. He loves the part of you that got serious. He he looks at this whole thing and just says, look at this journey. What an incredible journey. Oh, I love it. And here's, here's the deal. If you can know him in the now, and you can, you have to understand he has to come out of eternity into your timeline of right now. Well, if he can come out of eternity in your timeline right now, he can also show up here or show up here because God is not subject to time. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. I know. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this too, man. I want to ask you guys to stand up. You, you don't need to be afraid of your timeline, of your beginning or your end. I don't know if I'm going to outlive every single one of you or if I'm not going to outlive any of you. I don't have any idea of that. The Lord has not told me when my days are over with yet, but I'm asking him about it. I'm seriously asking, hey God, can you tell me how much longer I have to live? Because I need to know what I need to really take serious. (laughs) That's funny to me. He's like, well, you knucklehead, you should take it all serious. That's what you should do. You should be prepared as if you're going to live another hundred years. And you should also be prepared as if, you know, today's your last day. And walk with me in that. But I am telling you, my friends, that this is the truth. This is what's real. The timeline doesn't own you if Jesus is in the timeline with you. And that's beautiful to me. So let's pray real quick. You ready? Father God, sir, we come to you, Lord, and we love you and we praise you and we thank you, God, that you are indeed the ancient of days. You are older than time. Father God, sir, you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You are the first and the last. And God, we declare, sir, that you are there at our beginning You're there, sir, at our ending. You're with us right now, and we are already somehow seated with you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God, I love you, Lord, and I pray, God, that we would have mastery in our timelines, Lord. I pray, Father God, sir, in the name of Jesus, that we would not be overcome or overwhelmed by the day that we live in. But, God, you have a special grace for this time and season 
for the performance of the purpose of this time and season. God, I say yes to that. I say thank you, Lord, for the day that you've trusted me with. Let all my days glorify you, sir. In Jesus' name, amen.